so I'd like to start and welcome everyone for coming. We have uh, students from Professor Feldman's class, from Professor Karate's classes. I see some of my political science too class as well, my comparative politics students. So I'm really happy to see so many of you on this call. And, you know, this is a really important issue that our country is facing right now. So I think this is such a timely event. And I think that you're going to learn a great deal. So I want to welcome everyone. I'm Professor Carolyn Dudek. I'm the chair of the political science department. This uh, speaker series is part of the Hofstra Votes program, which has been a program running for several years related to um, voter registration, getting out the vote, and just informing like basic civic ideas within American politics. This event is sponsored by the Peter S. Calico School of Government, Public Policy and International Affairs the Peter S. Calico Center for the Study of the American Presidency, and the Department of Political Science. I'd like to thank the Hofstra University Cultural Center, especially Carol Mallison and all of her assistants in organizing this event, as well as Johanna Farrell as well. I'd also like to thank the Dean uh, of the College of Arts and Sciences, Dean Ben Rifkin, for all of his support and help in putting together these events. And I want to make a really special thank you to my colleague, Professor Mina Bose, who's here on, on the call. Um, Mina, but Professor Bose is the Calico School Executive Dean for Public Policy and Public Service Programs, and she was also instrumental in putting together this speaker series, and I want to thank her for all of her assistance. So the PSC Talks Politics series began last year, and it was a decision on the part of the political science department to highlight our experts in the field and to really focus in on election 2020. And so this is the next installment of that series. Um, coming up as part of the wider um, Hofstra Vote series and uh, as part of the Calico School, our next event is going to be happening on Wednesday, September 30th from 11.15 to 12.40. It will also be a virtual event. And the title of the presentation is What Do Voters Say About Candidates and Issues in 2020? Professors Bose and and Burnett will both be presenting their findings from the Calico poll, which is a political poll, a public opinion poll that Hofstra has been hosting. So we're very excited to hear what their latest findings are. We had a report in the spring and I'm sure that their findings will be very interesting as we are approaching the election. So make sure you mark your calendars for September 30th from 11.15 to 12.40. So I'd like to, invent, uh, to introduce our speaker today. Our speaker is Professor Rosanna Parati. She's an Associate Professor of Political Science at Hofstra University. She is our Internship Coordinator for the Public Policy and Public Service Program, Director of the Accelerated Law Program, and she's also the former Chair of the Department of Political Science and has been a, an enormous help to me as the current Chair of Political Science. She teaches courses on American politics, parties in the voter, public opinion, and political communications, U.S. immigration policy and women and politics. She's been a very she's been very active both on and off campus in voter registration efforts. She has edited or co-edited several volumes on the American presidency, such as Foreign Policy in the Clinton Administration: A True Third Way, Domestic Policy in the Presidency of William Jefferson Clinton, the and the Domestic Policy of the George H. W. Uh, of George H.W. Bush. She has also recently published an article entitled Scientist Without Borders, Immigrants and the Apollo Program. Professor Prati is a beloved and highly respected member of the Hofstra faculty and has worked tirelessly with students and alumni to teach career building skills and to provide many experiential learning opportunities to our students. And so I am absolutely delighted to introduce my friend and my colleague, 
Professor Rosanna Prati. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank my department colleagues, particularly Chair Dudek and Professor Feldman and Professor Bose for their commitment to this series of lectures, which they envisioned as a series of sort of backgrounders for lay people and students prior to the 2020 election. Now, before I get started here, I want to make a few announcements. Uh, a few talks are coming up. The October lecture in this series uh, will be given by my colleague and former HCLAS Dean Bernard Firestone. That's uh, Wednesday, October 21st. Just mark your calendars. And then um, related to what I'm going to talk about today, a panel on voting rights featuring two colleagues from the law school, Professors James Sample and Mark Niles, as well as Hofstra alumnus uh, Will Davis. So that's Day of Dialogue, October 28th, and it's also going to be at 4.30 p.m. Um, I'm going to share my screen now so that you can not look at my mug and look at some pretty colors. Um, I want to also say if you're not registered to vote or you'd like to request an absentee ballot, Hofstra Votes, with the help of four of my Honors College students, is holding weekly hours where volunteers will help you find out if you're registered, get registered, and apply for an absentee ballot. It's on Wednesdays from 3 to 4 p.m. You can get the link by um, going to the events page, uh, events.hofstra.edu. Um, and I also want to mention that the deadline to register to vote in New York is October 9th. Deadline to postmark an application for an absentee ballot for the general election is Tuesday, October 27th. Last day to postmark a ballot before the general election, Tuesday, November 2. And remind you that New York State has early in-person voting that runs from October 24th to November 1. If you know somebody who needs to register to vote, please send them my way. My email is in the chat and we'll commend them to the care of the excellent Carly Weinstein and Maddie Mento of University Relations, along with my PolySci 114 honors uh, option team. Now, I'm going to raise a number of questions in my talk today to simulate your thinking and to help us understand maybe where we stand today as we look ahead at the 2020 election. First off, whoops, there are the dates. <laughs> First off, how much do we value voting? Is it important to us? Where in the Constitution does it say we have the right to vote? How did the federal government help to expand the reach of voting rights in the United States? Now, with all that expansion, why is it that voter turnout in our national elections recently ranged between 36 and 60%? Aside from institutional reform, what kinds of strategies work to mobilize people to go out to the polls? And returning to institutional reforms, what finally can be done to fight state sanctioned voter suppression and create a more uniform set of rules for voter access? Lots and lots to talk about. So let me start with the importance of voting. Did you know that John Kennedy won the state of Hawaii by 115 votes in 1960? Did you know George W. Bush won the presidency by just 537 votes in Florida in 2000? Al Franken won the U.S. Senate seat in Minnesota over a Hofstra grad in 2008 by just 312 votes. Donald Trump won with a total of just 80,000 votes out of 14 million in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. This indicates that voting can be very consequential. Majorities of Americans say they intend to vote. Well, majorities of older Americans anyway. And even though they vote at relatively low levels, they vote more than they do a whole bunch of things. Sign petitions, boycott, post on social media, these figures come from the Pew Research Center. So if it was all that important to vote, these guys must have put a right to vote in the Constitution in 1787, right? Well, this is sort of a trick question. A right is a power that cannot be taken away by government unless for a very good reason. 
Think here about freedom of speech, freedom of religion, assembly in Article I of the Constitution. The original Constitution made two mentions of the right to vote. Article I, Section 2 says that states may decide who is qualified to vote. And Article I, Section 4 says that states may determine how the election process goes. This is literally what the Constitution says. In Article I, Section 2, the voters in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for the, for the voters of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. Now notice that the framers of the Constitution here gave the states the power to determine who may and may not vote. And then in Article I, Section 4, the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof, but the Congress may at any time, by law, make or alter such regulations. Again, notice that importantly, the state governments, not the national government, are given the primary say-so over how elections are run in the United States. Now, of course, the original Constitution was written in 1787. That document was amended almost immediately to recognize that people had certain rights that the national government couldn't take away. Freedom of speech, religion, assembly, privacy, legal representation. But the Constitution did not explicitly recognize people's right to vote. It still doesn't give all eligible citizens an explicit right to vote. It wasn't until 1868 that the Constitution began to be amended to recognize the right to vote of particular groups of people. And I've listed them here, but we're gonna talk about some of these later on. Over the time, the states enacted three key qualifications for voters. First off, dealing with citizenship. By 1926, all the states had enacted requirements that you could be a citizen uh, that you had to be a citizen to vote in national elections. Think of that. Prior to, to 1894, 12 states actually allowed non-citizens to vote, and some states still allow non-citizens to vote in local elections. Residence was another uh, requirement enacted by the states. Many states required that people live in the state for long periods of time, residency, in order to vote. Registration was another thing that states required. For many years, they required that you register way beforehand in order to be able to vote in national elections. And that kept out people like itinerants, and young voters, and black people. Uh, this is, by the way, a voter registration card. It's an interesting voter registration card because it's also, it's a little hard to read, but it also, um, is uh, asks the registrant whether or not he or his grandfather was eligible to vote in 1867. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. The, the National Voter Registration Act of 1993 made it illegal for a state to have a registration deadline more than 30 days before an election. Today, 15 states have a voter registration deadline that's 28 to 30 days before election day, and 19 states allow registration on election day itself. In 1970, Congress amended the Voting Rights Act to bar states from having more than a 30-day residency requirement. As many as 26 states still have these durational residency requirements, which require a voter to have lived in a state for anywhere between 10 and 30 days. We'll talk about further state restrictions on the right to vote later in our discussion, and we'll ask about whether it's time for the US Congress or even a constitutional amendment to once again step in to create more uniformity in voting laws across the country. But I wanna talk about increasing federal uh, regulation where something I call the rise of the US electorate. Largely because states have had so much power over election law, the history of enfranchisement in the United States is one of long, hard-fought expansions in the categories of people allowed to vote. Many states were reluctant to allow these voters to participate, and the national government was reluctant to interfere with them. Race was, of course, the first exclusion. Black people were ostensibly to be given the right to vote by the passage of the 15th Amendment, ratified in 1870, after a bloody civil war that claimed more than 700,000 lives. It read, 
The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And secondly, the Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. But state and local officials use physical intimidation, literacy tests, poll taxes, grandfather clauses, and white primaries to effectively keep blacks out of the electorate largely until 1965. Grandfather clauses and white primaries were outlawed by the Supreme, outlawed by the Supreme Court in 1915 and 1944, respectively. Poll taxes, fees of little more than $1.50, which were imposed at the time of registration and were required to register to vote. These were abolished by the 24th Amendment, ratified in 1964. But the greatest living, growing federal protections for voting rights finally came 10 years after the Montgomery boycott, 10 years after Brown versus Board of Ed, nearly 100 years after the 15th Amendment, when a heavily Democratic Congress, led by a Southern president, Lyndon Johnson, passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The Voting Rights Act was a far-reaching extension of the federal power into the field of voting, which had heretofore been the exclusive preserve of the states. Voting Rights Act barred states from using literacy tests, far from being just measures of whether a person could read and write, Literacy tests by the 1960s had become elaborate tests of whether blacks would, would be able to read or interpret portions of their state constitutions or the federal constitution. The grading requirements of literacy tests were subjective. They were done by local and county boards of elections. The Voting Rights Act was the beginning of the end of these tests. The Voting Rights Act authorized the appointment of federal examiners from the Justice Department to oversee blacks the registration of blacks in certain states and counties. It authorized the attorney general to seek injunctions against those who prevent blacks from voting. It authorized that local registrars keep voting and registration records for 22 months. It prohibited them from applying voting requirements unequally. And of course, section five of the Voting Rights Act required certain state and local jurisdictions to pre-clear proposed changes in voting and elections procedures with the U.S. Department of Justice or the U.S. District Court in the District of Columbia. Which jurisdictions would be covered? Section four clarified that. Those jurisdictions that met a particular formula, th those jurisdictions where in 1964 there had been a test or a divide restricting the right to vote, or jurisdictions where less than 50% of the voting age population was registered or 50, with less than 50% of the voting age persons had voted in the 1964 election. And what states and jurisdictions were they? Well, they came to include Alabama, Alaska, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, Virginia, and entire counties in places like Arizona, Hawaii, Idaho, North Carolina. The Voting Rights Act had a tremendous effect on black voter registration in the South. And you can see here for a moment, this is a, a favorite chart of mine from a textbook that we use in class, but it illustrates the difference in voter registration in the various Southern states. Uh, in 1960, in two, 2012 and 2014, top bar is 2014, percentage of black voters registered in that state in 2014, um, bottom bar is the percentage that had been registered in 1960. So here in Alabama, 14% of black, uh, black residents who were eligible to vote had been registered in 1960. That increased to 69% in 2014. Going to Mississippi, 5% of the eligible African-American voters were registered in the state of Mississippi in 1960. By, nine, by 2014, 91%. Um, and so on across the, um, these states that were, um, that were covered in the South by the Voting Rights Act, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia. The federal government also stepped in to end some gender exclusions in the original document. 
women had been agitating for the right to vote since at least 1848, the date of the Seneca Falls Convention. By 1915, several states allowed women to vote. And by 1920, Congress had passed and the states had ratified the 19th Amendment, which reads, the right of citizens to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. And Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. It should be noted that one of the ways white leaders in the suffragist movement gained sufficient support to pass and ratify the amendment was to distance black women out of fear of losing Southern support for their movement. The idea was that the amendment was needed first. Real voting rights for non-white women would be put on the back burner. The contributions of black women suffragists are just becoming more recognized thanks to the scholarship of historians like Martha Jones, author of a new book entitled Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. For Chinese American women and black women, meaningful enfranchisement would not come until much later, in 1943 and 1965, respectively. Age was another category. Young people age 18 to 20 years old haven't always had the right to vote. During the Vietnam War, voting rights activists argued that if at 18 they were old enough to be drafted, they were old enough to vote. Congress acquiesced in proposing the 26th Amendment ratified by the states in 1971. Now, do young people vote at rates, at rates similar to older people? Another favorite chart of mine compares voter turnout amongst young people with voter turnout amongst really old people, 65 and older. Um, if you look at 1972, the first <coughs> presidential election in which uh, people age 18 were allowed to vote nationally, 49.6 of them turned out to vote compared to 63.5% of eligible 65 plus people. After that, turnout among young people, and by the way, these are your parents and your professors, uh, turnout among young people declined over time. You can see 1984, it was 40.8, while the oldsters were voting at 68% rate. Um, in 1988, a real low of 36.2% of um, 18 to 25 year olds voting in the presidential election uh, compared to 69% of uh, plus 65 plus year olds. But you can also see that as time went on, um, that varied and young people kind of um, uh, t came, turned out at higher levels, never quite as high as people who are over 65. And we can talk about why that's the case um, in the Q&A period, but um, younger people, uh, chronically vote at lower levels than their parents or their grandparents, um, uh, though their voter turnout has uh, varied over time. It took an incredibly long time for Blacks, women, and young people to move the political gears necessary to overcome state barriers and win the right to vote. With that kind of prolonged effort, we would expect to see high levels of turnout, right? Well, not so. Levels of turnout in US elections have been low in comparison with earlier points in history and low in comparison with turnout in other advanced democracies. We're gonna look at that in a moment. For a point of reference, turnout in the 2014 House and Senate elections was 36.4% of eligible voters in the United States. So House and Senate elections 2014, that's the off year. That's when the president is not running uh, for re-election. In 2016, when there was an open seat, presidential election brought out 58% of eligible voters. In 2018, House and Senate elections again, turnout was a whopping 49%, which is actually very high. You can see the uptick there in the chart on the red line for midterm elections. Uh, uh, a whopping 49%. Um, we can talk about why people came out at such high rates and we'll discuss that um, uh, later. So you look at the historical trend um, and one of the things that we see here, we, we look at this a lot in my class, um, my voting class, the turnout 
for presidential and midterm elections declined precipitously in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Um, if you look at turnout in the United States compared to turnout in other countries, it's also quite low. Um, and, um, you know, you can look at turnout in other countries as kind of commensurate to turnout at those very high rates in the late 1800s. I want you to look here at this list of um, OECD countries. At the top here, we have Belgium. The green, uh, the, the blue dot indicates uh, the percentage of voting age population that turned out to vote. The, the tan dot indicates the percentage of registered voters in that country that turned out to vote. And so you can see, if you look down here um, at the bottom, you can see the percentages. The turnout in Belgium was super high compared to the United States. It was like 90% of eligible voters and, and about 90% of registered voters. Well, Turkey also had a high vote, a voter turnout, high eligibles, high proportion of registered voters. Sweden, Denmark had a high proportion of people who were registered, but not so high a proportion of people who are eligible. Where's the United States in this chart? Whoops, it's all the way down at the bottom. Here's the turnout of eligible voters in the United States. Here's the turn, which is at about, you know, 55% in um, 2012. Um, turnout um, of um, registered voters was at about 85% of registered voters. So why is turnout so low compared with turnout earlier in history and turnout in other Western democracies? There are a lot of reasons. Looking at the historical perspective, just in the United States, voter registration became widespread during the progressive era. You see, during this period that spans the um, turn of the 20th century. Precisely at that point, but reported voter turnout began to decline precipitously. The burdens of voter registration have kept a proportion of would-be voters away from the polls in the United States and away from the polls in the United States where there had been more voters historically. And, and the burden probably cuts down on fraudulent activities such as mobile voting by the same person or voting by dead people or pets. But our practice of self-initiated registration really cuts down on the percentage of people who vote compared with other countries. Looking at the, com uh, at the comparative perspective, we first have to look at how many people are unregistered in the United States. Some 51 million Americans, or 24% of, of the voting age population, are eligible to vote but are not registered. Some 40% of eligible Latinx individuals, 45% of Asian Americans who are eligible to vote, they're not registered to vote. 40% of vote eligible millennials, 30% of vote eligible African Americans and 32% of unmarried women are unregistered to vote. Uh, those figures are from 2017, by the way, so hopefully we've made a little bit of a dent in the last couple of years. Now, looking at the comparative perspective, there are some countries, 13% of them in the world, that have compulsory voting. You actually are penalized if you don't go out to vote. Australia, Egypt, Turkey, Brazil, and Mexico are among those countries. But more common are systems in which the government either takes an active role in initiating the registration process or automatically registers voters somehow. 91% of, of eligible adults are registered in Germany. 92% of eligible adults are registered in Canada. Now, both of these are federal systems like ours. How do these nations increase registration? Germany maintains a civil registry overseen at the local level. It shares the civil registry information with local election authorities, which create voter lists. And by civil registry, we say, you know, who's born, who dies, who gets married, and so forth. Germans who are 18 or older on voting day automatically receive a notification card before any election in which they're eligible to vote. But Canada's system might be more replicable in the United States. 
Because Germany has something like a, a voter ID, a, excuse me, a national ID card system. In Canada, on the other hand, the national government in Canada has a central election authority. It's called Elections Canada. It identifies unregistered voters and newly eligible voters. Provincial agencies such as DMVs and health insurance agencies provide their information to update the database of eligible voters. So do national agencies such as taxing authorities and the National Immigration Bureaucracy. In addition, in Canada, and in, actually in several American states, citizens can reg register on election day itself. So this allows active people like people with young children, young people, geographically mobile people, people with disabilities to register more conveniently. Advocates of election day registration argue that far from being prone to fraud, election day registration makes registration more secure because it's conducted under the eye of the voting state official and it requires a variety of legal documents. The states in the United States that do this may collect information from voters that would facilitate cross-checking their identity and residency with other state databases. They can cast provisional ballots and be placed on special lists, which are then reviewed by political parties after election day. In this way, cost is minimized. Again, that's really like the Canadian system. Some 21 states now have election day registration according to the National Council of State Legislatures. From their experiences, there's strong evidence that same day election and election day registration could increase voter turnout by as much as 5%. What's not clear is whether same day registration shapes partisan outcomes or whether certain demographic groups are more likely to benefit. And of course, that's really the whole ball of wax. Looking at the historical data in the United States, we see that voter turnout increased markedly in 2018 across groups. Um, and here, we're gonna look at something like this again, but here is a breakout of the electorate. 51.3% of white voters came out to vote in 1990, those midterm elections. In the 2018, midterm elections, that had increased to 57.5%. There, in, there was an uptick in turnout in 2018 amongst white voters, amongst black voters, amongst Asian and Latino voters, all across the spectrum, um, a hike in the percentages of people who came out over the percentages of people who had voted in 2014. <laughs> In fact, all major, not only um, were there increases in all major racial and, and ethnic groups in 2018, but the number of Latino voters nearly doubled from 2014 to 2018, nearing presidential election year levels. Among Latinos and Asians, the voter turnout rate in 2018 for naturalized citizens was higher than among the US born. Asian and Hispanic voters were more likely than those in other groups to report casting their votes by early or by early balloting or by mail. My Lord. Now, any explanation of voter turnout in the United States has to take into consideration the vast literature on who votes and why. And by the way, this is a picture of myself and a couple of poli sci students who registered all of one voter. Uh, on one of the final days of our voter registration drive uh, last year. Unfortunately, we've un been unable to table and we're trying to do it with similar results online. <laughs> um, but who votes? Uh, it's, it's hard to discuss this without talking about demographics. Education has an almost direct relationship with a person's propensity to vote. This graphic was compiled by Professor Michael McDonald at the University of Florida. It tracks responses from the Census Bureau's current population survey over the past 30 years. As you can see, people with the highest turnout are the ones who have the highest levels of formal education. And I'm sure poli sci one, you're gonna learn this if you haven't already. Um, the people designated by the purple line who have a postgraduate education are more like uh, uh, turned out at higher levels than people with some college, than college grads, than high school grads, and people indicated in the blue who have less than a high school education. And you know, why is that the case that people with less of an education uh, come out to vote at lower rates? One of the main reasons is that having this great education that you are embarking upon gives you resourcefulness. You 
learn how to learn how to look for things. How do I register to vote? Don't know how. Let me look on. So this makes me wonder what policy differences are there between highly educated voters and people with a lower level of education? Well, in general, less educated voters are less in <laughs> they're less supportive of civil liberties, but also when considered with income, they're more supportive of government. Professor Parati, just unmute yourself, please. Thought I had done so. Am I unmuted? Thank you. You're Super. Okay. So less educated voters are less internationalists, less supportive of civil liberties, um, but also when considered with income, they're more supportive of government programs like health care, education, and retirement benefits. What would happen if they came out to vote at higher levels and the other ones didn't? There are dramatic age disparities in voting. The oldest voters tend to turn out at higher levels than the youngest, which we saw already. Now, look at young people here. They're the blue line, um, 18 to 29. Um, their numbers are lower than the next oldest age group of 30 to 44 years, but look, they're kind of catching up with them, <laughs> or at least they, they, um, they were catching up with them in 2014, 2016, and 2018. Um, again, turnout among the oldest people is highest. Your parents' generation is, um, is next highest, and um, those who are maybe the younger brothers and sisters of your parents is next. Why is that? It's because those people who are oldest have the greatest stake in, in the outcome of the election, a whole lot of different reasons. Younger people tend to be more mobile, tend to have less information about voting. Again, we can talk about that one-on-one, -on -one, um, but because we're in such a big group, we'll save that until later. So this makes us wonder though, what are the policy differences between the youngest and the oldest voters? And you could probably speak to that best, but we can look at some Pew Research charts. Younger people were much more supportive of, for instance, President Obama than older people were. They're less supportive of President Trump than older people are. So again, what you can see here is younger people um, again, uh, supporting Obama at much higher levels than the silent generation, your grandparents, supporting millennials, supporting um, Trump at much lower levels than the silent generation. And there are other differences too. Um, younger people are more likely than older people to see racial discrimination as the main reason why black people can't get ahead. And that's increasingly so. Look at how how many more young people believe that discrimination accounts for black for barriers to black pro progress? How many more young people believe that than older people, um, members of the so-called silent generation, your grandparents' generation? Look too at the differences here. Young people are more likely than older people to see immigrants as a plus for the country. Again, young people are depicted with the tan. Um, line millennials responded to that question about um, are immigrants, uh, do immigrants strengthen our economy because of their hard work and talents? Young people answer that in the affirmative and at much higher rates than the silent generation. So what I'm establishing here is that young people think differently than old people and they look different than old people. They're, the composition of their generation is different from the composition of the silent generation. Young people are more diverse than the oldest group of voters. And you can see here that millennials are comprised of a smaller percentage of white citizens and larger percentages of African-Americans, Asians, and other uh, demographic groups. So, um, so millennials and Gen Xers actually look different than the oldest cadre of voters. And that, that leads me to wonder, 
if young people came out to vote at rates similar to older people, what additional voices would be heard? And by the way, young people's turnout in 2018 increased and increased at greater at a, at a higher level than the increase in the level of turnout of people in the 25 to 34 group, the 35 to 44 group, and so on. So um, young people are not doing that badly in terms of getting out the vote and um, at least um, um, trying to compete with the turnout rates of the old. There are also differential turnout rates for people of different races and ethnicities. And the racial disparities in the health and economic effects of COVID-19 will surely exacerbate old patterns. Black voter turnout used to trail white voter turnout persistently. That gap narrowed over time. As you can see, black turnout is the red line here and white voter turnout, uh, uh, non-Hispanic white voter turnout is blue here. So um, black voter turnout overtook white turnout in 2008 and 2012. Black turnout again decreased in 2016 um, as voters wrestled with the, the absence of a minority candidate at or near the top of the ticket. But Latino turnout has chronically lagged behind both white and black turnout. Look at Hispanic turnout here, the green line. Um, this is so even as the proportion of Latinos in the electorate is growing. And here, uh, the proportion of Latinos in the electorate is marked by the dark brown. As you can see, we're looking from 1990 to 2018, the Latino portion is steadily and exponentially growing here. It's so may I call you back after I see Professor Parati Zoom? Um, um, okay, can I, will I be? Professor Parati, unmute yourself, please. Thank you. So sorry, so sorry. Okay, Latinos turned out in record numbers in 2018, but polling suggests that their enthusiasm for both Joe Biden and Trump lag behind their support for Hillary Clinton and Trump in 2016, and that the 2020 candidates are underperforming Latino support even in the 28 midterms. That means that Latino turnout may not be as great as expected, and it may decline if the parties and candidates don't make a concerted effort to reach out to Latino voters in the states where there are pluralities or simply growing minorities. The pandemic has wreaked havoc with gout out the vote efforts among all the lower turnout groups. One activist told the Atlantic magazine recently, is it a virus that's killing us at three times the level other people, or is it unemployment? Is it family members that are in limbo because of immigration status right now? I'm worried about the turnout in November of people that are unemployed or trying to feed their family. And we are trying to get them out to go vote. So again, the point I'm making is that Latinos are on track to be the largest minority group in the electorate in 2020. We really don't know whether COVID is going to prevent that from happening, but we would have expected that to happen under normal circumstances. Though heavily affected by the pandemic, Latinos are not as familiar with mail-in ballots, uh, activists are concerned. And, and the pandemic has made it difficult to reach out to, to Latino voters who feel their vote won't make a difference or who believe that their vote will be chaos in an unformed way. This is for the political scientists among us. Long ago in 1957, political scientist Anthony Downs devised a sort of equation that explains why individuals make the choice to vote. Propensity to vote is a function of benefits minus the benefits that voters would expect to get out of voting in the election, minus the costs for going out and registering and getting to the polls, plus the really big variable, the sense of duty. If the actual stakes for a voter are high or their sense of duty is high, their propensity to vote will be higher. Conversely, if election law or other phenomena cre create costs for voting, travel, preparation, research, the risk of contracting a dreaded disease, 
the voter will have a lower likelihood of voting. If the voter has a low sense of duty or their vote has a minimal chance of affecting the outcome of the race, the voter will be less likely to vote. More recently, political scientist Bernard Fraga in the Turnout Gap published in 2018 wonders why Latino and Asian turnout have been so chronically low. He suggests that voters' calculations of costs and benefits are also affected by other factors. Voters' sense of group empowerment, the extent to which their demographic group has achieved significant representation and influence in political decision-making. He says it's also related to elite mobilization, how hard politicians work to actually reach out and mobilize voters, particularly minority voters, and ask them to vote. The propensity to vote may also depend on the relative size of the racial or ethnic group. In jurisdictions where racial or ethnic group accounts for a larger share of the population, elites may be more likely to mobilize minority voters. Given that, what kinds of appeals might be successful at getting people out to vote? Well, there are a few things we're pretty sure don't work. Phone banks with a canned script don't work. Email reminders and texts and Facebook messages that are impersonal don't work very well. Leafleting and voter guides really don't work very well. What does work generally? This is a topic examined by political scientists Donald Green and Alan Gerber in a recent book called Get Out the Vote, published in 2019. The research tells us that social pressure works at getting people to get go out to vote. Green and Gerber cite experiments in which voters were informed of whether they had vo voted in the past, which is public record, by the way, and were told essentially to clean up their act in the upcoming election. Gratitude works as a way of getting people to come out and vote. Thank you, a, a mailing saying thank you for voting in the past, and we look forward to seeing you at the polls again next week. Many non-voters actually think of themselves as voters. They remember having voted in the distant past and they will respond to re requests for them to perform their civic duty in a week. Calling res residents to ask them to pledge to vote and then reminding them of that pledge in a later call, that works too. The research on voter mobilization suggests that as all of us face more and more communications and distractions, it becomes more and more valuable to us to feel wanted at the polls. Citizens respond to real conversations by phone rather than by canned scripts. They respond to calls from people with whom they have some connection, something in common. This has been found to be true in the mobilization of voters in all demographic groups, and it's behind the current surge in so-called relational organizing, which harnesses the formidable influence that peers exert over one another. So by the way, if you hear from your child or your brother or your neighbor by phone, hello, I just want to remind you to go out to vote. Relational organizing at work. Lisa Garcia Bedoya, who writes about registering and turning out Latino voters, writes, it's the social and interactive aspects of canvassing that make it effective. With social persuasion, it's not the informational content of the mailing that's most important, but how it relates to individuals' self-understandings and their perceptions of themselves vis-a-vis -vis others, vis -vis others. Now back to institutions. We've looked briefly at some individual level calculations about voting and how individuals might be induced to participate more fully to have their voices heard. But as voting rights crusaders found during the summer of 64, regardless of how many vote, mo voter mobilization drives you might organize, unless state laws and institutions are changed, the deck will be stacked against some people. State laws and institutions can make the costs of voting incredibly burdensome for particular groups. In this last section of my talk, I wanna talk about voter suppression and suggest some routes for institutional reform. But I wanna start this last part of the talk with the 2000 presidential election. By late evening on election night in 2000, attention had centered on Florida, which held 25 electoral votes. Republican George, George W. Bush and, and his Democratic opponent, Al Gore, 
led his Democratic opponent, Al Gore, by 1,784 votes out of 6 million votes across Florida. The closeness of this election would trigger an automatic recount. Al Gore, who had conceded the election, withdrew his concession and manual recounting began. All the people over 40 will remember this election, a real nightmare that lasted for nearly a month, actually maybe more than a month. Um, myriad problems had plagued the voter, uh, the, the voting in Florida in 2000. Shoddy punch card ballots were hard to recount, and all two human vote counters had to make value judgments about whether the ballots with hanging chads should be counted or not. All along the way, Florida's partisan elected officials had set the rules for voter, voter access. Florida had had strict disenfranchisement of felons and had conducted voter purges that had mistakenly deleted many voters from the rolls. Infamously in Palm Beach and Broward counties, the confusing ballot design likely led older voters to mark their cards for reform county candidate uh, Pat Buchanan rather than Al Gore. You can see here, this is a punch card. And this, the, the um, spine of this punch card is actually metal. And as a voter, you are given this card that slides in to a template. If you press your little stylus wand into these little holes at the end of the arrow, you're casting a vote. Well, if you look at Al Gore and Joe Lieberman's section on the ballot, um, it's section five. Um, the voter has to scoot over next to section five and punch down real hard on that um, little circle and um, push a hole into his card. Well, looking over at the other side of the card, the reform party candidate, Pat Buchanan, is number four um, position on the ballot. If your eyesight isn't so great, you might actually punch your stylus into hole number four instead of hole number five. And um, in Palm Beach, there was an explicably high number of people who do that, um, which, which was Unusual, again, those who lived through the election will remember this, unusual given that a lot of older Democratic voters lived there. And we, ex we would have expected a higher number of votes for um, the Democratic candidate for president. Just one of the things that um, kind of happened in that, um, well, let me jump back here to the ballot, happened in that um, election. The case, of course, went to the Supreme Court, which put an end to the ballot counting. It was too late to continue the counting, the court said. The deadline has passed by which the national government needed the results from the states. Florida Secretary of State Kathleen Harris had certified the election for Bush. and All 25 of the electors from Florida got to go and participate in the electoral college balloting. Gore conceded in a nonpartisan recount of the state's votes after the whole institute concluded that Bush had won the popular vote in Florida. And we typically say that he won it by 537 votes. Now, why focus attention on the Bush-Gore election? Because after that election, Congress passed the Help America Votes Act, or HAVA, in 2002. HAVA allocated $3 billion to help states upgrade their voting systems it established the U.S. Election Assistance Commission to certify good voting technologies. It set minimum standards for voter technologies. It created computerized statewide voting lists. And in 2006, House and Senate elections, 80% of voters were using some form of electronic voting technology as a result. But for all of HAVA's good intentions, it created a number of new challenges. As law professor Richard Hayson writes in the new book, Election Meltdown, Dirty Tricks, Distrust, and the Threat to American Democracy, electronic voting and voter lists meant computer crashes and programming glitches, unrecorded votes, the possibility of hacked or rigged machines. HAVA failed to impose a requirement that voting officials be nonpartisan. Wisconsin, which had had 
a nonpartisan voting system adopted a partisan appointment process for voting officials after it was passed. In Georgia, just recently in 2018, Brian Kemp, chief elections official of, of the state, was authorized to make crucial voter access decisions in an election in which he himself successfully, not surprisingly, ran for governor. A story very recently chronicled in the documentary, Suppressed, the Right to Vote 2019. In the wake of the Help America Vote Act, we saw a wave of state restrictions aimed at vote suppression. States were treating the reform movement as an opportunity to restrict rather than enhance the franchise. And this is a typical of what happens at the state level when there's an opportunity to go back to state election law and make changes, other kinds of ch changes are often made. Here, there were crackdowns by, made by the states on voter registration drives. Many of the states began restricting groups that sponsored voter registration drives. Florida in 2004 imposed fines for forms handed in 10 days after they were collected that would incur a $250 fine. And a fine for losing voter registration forms, $5,000. Who would want to register voters if you could face losing five grand as a result? In Ohio, each registration volunteer was required to bring voter registration forms to the Board of Elections personally. In New Mexico, voter registration helpers were required to turn in forms within 48 hours or risk criminal charges. States also adopted policies in which they refused to add registrants to the voter rolls unless their voter registration information matched information in other government databases to the voter registration databases. So it's woohoo with the computerized lists at the state level. The matching process is prone to error. People with hyphenated names and names prone to multiple English spellings like Asian American names uh, American Indian names, Alaskan Native aim, uh, names, were most likely to have their registrations blocked by a mismatch. In LA County, almost 20% of eligible registrants were excluded from the rolls in 2006 because of matching problems before states revised, before that state revised its voter registration policies. Because of HAVA, the state's uh, performed regular maintenance of their electronic voter registration databases. They had to. And some states inevitably purged their voter rolls inaccurately. The most common problem occurred when an eligible voter's name matched a name on a list of ineligible voters like felons or people who had died or people who had moved to other states. States purged voters who shared the same name and birthday as another eligible voter. And in Florida in 2006, Blacks were 13% of the population, but four times as likely as whites to be purged using the matching methodology. Finally, states enacted unfair ID requirements. Indiana adopted a strict documentary requirement for voting, photo ID, government ID, or even proof of citizenship. Proponents' arguments, uh, the proponent's argument was that Voter ID would curb voter impersonation fraud, a type of fraud that is really quite rare. Voter ID may not seem like a burden and was deemed constitutional by the Supreme Court in 2008, but consider the difficulty of obtaining such documentation to a person who may not have gotten a birth certificate, like my parents, <laughs> or a poor or old person living in a state that requires them to travel miles away to the county seat to obtain documents or affidavits necessary to establish identification. Consider, too, that the Constitution was amended in 1964 to outlaw poll taxes of an average $1.50. Okay, eight or nine dollars in today's money. Obtaining a birth certificate or a passport or traveling to the county seat is often more expensive than that. It should be said that voter suppression has not been even across parties. Republican dominated legislatures have spearheaded voter restrictions and, uh, ostensibly because they're afraid of voter fraud, fraud, but really quite transparently out of fear that the changing demographics of the electorate that we just saw will cause them to lose their majorities. 
Following this initial wave of voter suppression laws, the U.S. Supreme Court decided the case Shelby County versus Holder, which dramatically weakened the Voting Rights Act. The court held that the national government was overreaching when it required preclearance for certain states when they seek to change their voting procedures. The majority held that black disenfranchisement along the scale of the 1960s and 70s was a thing of the past and that formulas harking back to those days unfairly burdened those states and counties that still required to pre, that were required to pre-clear their election changes. Notably, Ruth Bader Ginsburg in a ringing dissent to that case wrote, Throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. What has happened since 2013 when Shelby County was decided? Well, North Carolina changed its voting laws to cut early voting, create a photo ID requirement, eliminate same day registration. Some of those provisions too were invalidated in federal court. Right now, a total of 18 states require voters to present photo identification. And according to a Brennan Center survey, 25 states enacted new restrictions on voting and registration um, by 2018, from 2010 to 2018, 14 of them had, had instituted laws making it harder for citizens to register. Seven of them had cut back on early voting. Three of them had made it harder to restore voting rights for people with past criminal convictions. With preclearance gone, the only way to challenge unfair voting restrictions is through lawsuits, which take a long time. What will COVID due to voting. By late August, nine states in DC had committed to send ballots to all voters. 34, this is a graphic by the way from the, from the New York Times. Uh, 34 states had announced that absentee voting would be allowed in for all eligible voters. Seven states required an excuse for absentee ballots, for, uh, for absentee voting. And in New York state, um, um, has since included COVID in the list of excuses for absentee ballots. As of today, 61.4 million absentee ballots have been sent to voters in 28 states and DC. In 11 states, absentee, absentee requests have surpassed 2016 requests for absentee ballots. So if you're looking here, Florida has a gargantuan 4.6 million requests for absentee ballots <clears throat> in the 2020 election, already far outstripping requests uh, that were made in 2016. Thought it might be interesting for you to see here also from the Times, Democrats are more likely to request absentee ballots than Republicans. And that could be for any number of reasons because Democrats tend to be uh, um, more likely to be higher, in uh, to be lower income um, voters or wage earners, hourly wage earners who can't uh, take the time to go to the polls on election day. Um, but um, the trend that we're seeing in requests for absentee ballots are um, heavily favored Democrats, as most of us probably have read. What can be done to make voting more accessible and available to all? In the near term for 2020, there are a few things that you can do to make sure your vote counts and things go smoothly on election day in your world. Make a plan to vote. You can apply to be a poll worker. There's a great and dire need for poll workers because so many of the poll workers who, are, who, who have worked in the past are older people who are at risk of contracting uh, COVID. Find another way to turn in your ballot. That is to say, go to an early voting place to turn in your absentee ballot or turn it in um, if you're uh, from another state and they offer uh, collection boxes for ballots, do it that way. Stick with official sources of information. Make sure that you're not, uh, quote unquote, registering to vote with a group that you don't have any com uh, uh, confidence in. Make sure that you know how to cast your ballot before election day. And by all means, cast it 
if you can, before election day, get it in the mail or get it filled out or go in person um, early to an early voting place, have a plan, follow it through, research it. Don't delay. In the long term, there's much more work to be done. In a 2018 paper, the Brennan Center for Justice offers the following sets of recommendations to help get rid of the patchwork of state laws on voter access. They recommend modernizing voter, the voter process, enact automatic voter registration. This would increase participation and add 50 million voters to the rolls, the Brennan Center, Center argues. It would save money, it could increase accuracy, and in the past three years, 12 states have improved automatic registration anytime a citizen gives information to, this, to the states or the federal government, such as registering at the DMV or registering at a state university. Another suggestion, expand early voting. It gives people more opportunities to vote and it prevents long lines at the polls. Protect voting rights. Congress should restore the Voting Rights Act, update the preclearance formula required for preclearing state changes to election law. Um, that might involve having uh, a state's having had a record of voting, voting rights violation in the past 15 years or 25 years rather than in 1972. Uh, Congress should repeal disenfranchisement laws or the states at least should repeal disenfranchisement laws. This might increase national electorate by 4.7 million, protecting against improper purges of the voter rolls. States could inform voters when they do list maintenance and provide citizens with opportunities to register on election day if they get improperly purged. Protect against voter intimidation at the polls is another suggestion. Secure elections against foreign interference. Upgrade them, secure the voting apparatus, safeguard the voting rolls themselves from being hacked. And we know that the Russians have already tried to hack these at the state level. Perform frequent audits and threat analyses, upgrade voting machines and require a physical record of the ballot one that's verified by the voter. Law professor Richard Hayson suggests that in light of Shelby versus Holder and the court's reluctance to upend states' autonomy in voting law, Americans need to get behind a movement for new constitutional amendment guaranteeing the right to vote. That will require two thirds of the House and Senate to propose an amendment, and then another three fourths of the state legislatures to ratify. Could we muster the same political will for this amendment as we did for women's suffrage, for young people's suffrage? Could we muster the support for an equal right to vote for all eligible citizens? For each of us, it depends, going back to my first slide, on whether we consider it important to have our voices heard about the decisions that affect us every day, whether we'll be able to prevent future pandemics, whether we'll be able to mitigate the effects of climate change for ourselves and our neighbors, whether we want to continue or to reform the way we police our communities. And with that thought, I take your leave and I thank you and I am open to any questions. I think I'm gonna ask my colleagues. Um, well, Haley, I see that Haley Kugler has a question, so I'm yes. gonna have him. Ask. Hi, Hi Haley. Hi, Professor Brody. I saw you earlier. Um, my question for you is, because a lot of people that uh, fail to vote or choose not to vote, a lot of the time it's because of the lack of influence they feel that they have because of the electoral college. How do you recommend trying to remedy that in the future? Like making people feel like their vote matters more? Because for example, a lot of people, uh, are saying now that you should vote because a lot of people don't. And people are arguing, well, we did vote in the 2016 election and the electoral college kind of undid what the popular vote would have done. Yeah. So how do you kind of see combating that issue of the electorate versus the popular vote? Um, Haley, I think that, first of all, you know, there are two ways to attack that prompt to reform the institution, right? You can amend the constitution and get rid of the electoral college and have a popular vote. 
which is going to take one, you know, two thirds of Congress, three fourths of state legislature. But um, the other thing to do is to change the way the states allocate the electors. And there, uh, there are a number of movements to try and do that. And that would require only changes in state law. But let's assume that, um, let's assume just the most pessimistic view that we can't do that. Um, I still argue that that's a poor reason not to vote because down ballot, we have so many important races that have to be decided. The Senate is going to decide, you know, re regardless of whether the Senate decides on who the, the, um, uh, the next um, uh, Supreme Court justice is in the next couple of months, the Senate is, it, the Senate's control is in balance. And um, if you don't come out to vote in the presidential and incidentally vote in the Senate, um, elections, you're, you're essentially giving away your opportunity to have a say so in what happens in the Supreme Court. So my, um, even when I'm most pessimistic, I would argue to that voter that coming out to vote is of great consequence because there are down ballot things that are, that are decided by many fewer votes than the presidential election will be decided by. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Professor Feldman. First of all, Dr. Prati, thank you for uh, a comprehensive class on the history of voting. Really interesting, including that wacky ballot from uh, Palm Beach County. And actually, um, the Secretary of Voting, who uh, we I was familiar with, she I was fired. She was forced out of the job from Broward County because of uh, that sort of thing. But anyway, yeah, Florida is always a mess. But that ballot was outrageous. I mean, you know, now we can see why pe people couldn't figure out like where to where to push that or, and what was a vo what was a vote. If you can't figure out what a vote, what constitutes a vote, or or for whom you're voting, then you don't know how to count the vote. Very confusing. Okay. Uh, but my question has to do with Donald Trump. Um, the data show that the people who are well-educated, the college educated, um, tend to vote at a greater rate. But remember Donald Trump as the candidate said, we love the undereducated. Did he turn that upside down? You know, we, in my class, we've been looking at particular states and even localities where um, there was a surge in voter turnout in 2016 over, I'm sorry, in 20, yeah, 2016 over 2012. I just want to give you an example of um, what might be happening here. Um, Suffolk County, a, a student of mine said, you know, I, would, I, I saw a Trump rally in Suffolk County, and I think what, you, what um, Trump is doing is he's really mobilizing voters to come out. Um, I think what the campaign is doing is targeting particular group of groups of voters and, and succeeded in doing that in 2016. Um, in Suffolk County, there was a surge of voters and a, the, the, a vast proportion of them actually voted for Donald Trump. He, that, that campaign really mobilized them. So, so he's not necessarily mobilizing them across the board. And they do have different preferences from people who are um, more highly educated. And um, if you target that, um, then you'll be able to win in particular localities. I mean, that's my analysis, that it that we shouldn't be looking at overall trends at all in 2020. We really should be what was happening, looking at what's happening at the granular level at each state and within each state, actually. So I don't know if any of these students are here, but in 114, we're doing a big project where each student is looking at a state um, and, and really carefully looking at voting, the history of voting patterns and turnout in those states. Yeah, because clearly those are the people that you're going to want to get, maybe even in particular in the Midwest. There've, there've got to be a lot more voters without a college education than with a college education. Right. And, and of course, Trump has changed the composition of the Republican coalition, of the Republican base, so as to include um, and maybe to center on working class whites. 
um, which is for those young people who are, um, you know, for whom this is a kind of, uh, uh, for us, that's a really big change. That's a historic change in the Republican coalition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, any, uh, anybody else, any other hands, you can put them up in the, um, in the chat. We've got a lot of people out here or any observations that you want to make. I didn't talk a whole lot about dirty trick, um, or other kinds of th things like that, because I, I actually want to save some of that for our, um, panel, uh, on the day of dialogue when I'm going to have some real experts on voting law. Any other, um, comments or questions? Dr. Prati, could I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, this talk has been so informative, as, do, as Dr. Feldman said, and it's making me think a lot about, you know, opportunities to influence this race, just kind of being involved, as you said, what, what, indivi what individuals can do, and then what institutional changes are needed longer term to, in to expand voting. I guess one question that I have is, um, we're looking a lot at, at how the mail-in balloting, right, will affect um, the counting and what this means for election night. And um, I think a couple of states, just uh, Wisconsin and a couple of others just announced, right, that they extended the date for which uh, ballots can be accepted, right? I think it was supposed to be eight o'clock on election night. I'm pretty sure Wisconsin was one of them. And um, now it's going to be a few days after. Um, what? How would you say, what should we expect to find out on election night? And when realistically do you think we can expect um, some sort of a conclusive response? Uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're so in the moment mm -hmm. and maybe we need to give some patience, but we're, there are also certain deadlines that are coming up a few weeks after the election that need to be met and inauguration day is fixed. So, well, curious to hear your thoughts. I mean, I, I like all of us, I think all of us are um, of the same mind that it's really hard to tell. You, you might anticipate, you know, a couple of weeks, uh, you know, a couple of weeks after the election uh, at the at, at the um, at the outer limit, hopefully by a week after the election. Um, but this is really uh, this is really the big question. And my concern, of course, is that it. Um, it, we're concerned about the peaceful transfer of power. We're always concerned about the peaceful transfer of power in elections. That's the reason why voting rules, precise voting rules are so important. And um, the, the imprecision of putting back a deadline will call into question the legitimacy of the election. Um, so, I mean, that, that raises another issue too of um, if the, if the loser of the election does not accept the way these rules have been interpreted, we're going to have a real mess. Um, so I don't have a good answer for your question. Well, I, you know, I would ask my colleagues because you are just as involved in this as I am. Have you been thinking about that? No, it's a hard one. I was hoping you'd have a good answer. <laughs> you know, I keep trying to get a sense. Uh, and I think we can only know that from election officials, you know, and attorneys. We, um, yeah, we really, we, I really can't tell right now. Okay, all right, thank you, fair answer. I think that's the question that really should be on our minds right now is about the legitimacy of these mail-in ballots and also whether or not our mail-in ballots will actually get in. We have an expert on this sitting right in front of me, Barbara Epstein from the League of Women Voters is with us today. Uh, and it's, and thank you so much for being here, Barbara. Um, but who knows better than anybody because um, Barbara has been registering voters for a, a long time and um, one little imprecision can invalidate somebody's ballot as she well knows. Um, anybody else? I, any other questions? I've beaten you into submission. <laughs> can You've given us a lot to consider. I'm just gonna ask a quick question back to what you were just talking about with invalidating um, ballots and, and the discussion that has gone on um, coming from the administration and in the Twitter sphere about, you know, can we trust mail-in ballots? Can we trust mail-in ballots? 
Well, a, a number of states have been using absentee ballots for a very long time. Um, and apparently, you know, the, the president tries to differentiate between absentee ballots and what he calls mail-in ballots, but essentially they're, they're absentee ballots that are sent to every, to every voter without an excuse. Um, they're as safe as each state is, um, is willing to make them, and the states have been um, in this business for a while. I, I think it's really damaging to... Um, question the legitimacy of pra these practices. That said, um, I mean, everything that we know is that the state election, the state boards of election and election officials are under enormous stress. Um, and so is the post office, of course, to try and do this right, to make sure that this is done right. But I don't, I don't think it's productive to attack the legitimacy of that process. Are there any other questions from anyone? Any uh, any of our experts want to chime in? I think I see Sam Rubenfeld, one of our alum. If anybody knows about dirty tricks, it's Sam. He's <laughs> Hello. Um, can you uh, anything to you, Sam? Um, I guess my question, uh, and I put it in the chat as well, is one of partisanship of the Supreme Court. Um, John Roberts has made his, it, his life project to eliminate voting rights, according to multiple reports over the last 10 or 15 years about his uh, voting record and rulings of the Supreme Court, his time before the Supreme Court. Um, I guess with a current five to three court, um, how, and. Pen, potentially pending a six to three court, how much will the partisanship of the court play a role in the end result of the, the legitimacy of the end result? Yeah, I, I thought about that a lot. And my, and my thinking about that um, area is like my thinking about other things. At a certain point, um, Robert's is gonna have to think about the legitimacy of the court itself. Um, and so I am gonna reserve judgment. Um, you know, the court upheld Voter ID requirements, but it struck, um, but it allowed, it it, it let alone uh, um, a circuit court uh, a decision that struck down some of the aspects of the North Carolina law. So, uh, you know, I um, um, the one thing I would add is um, in Shelby when the pre when uh, the Supreme Court struck down aspects of the Voting Rights Act. There were other counties in that were subject to free clearance that weren't necessarily seen, uh, that weren't part of the South. Boroughs in New York City were among them. Absolutely. And right. there were uh, significant purges of ballots in the last several election cycles in New York City, uh, large ones. I think one was in Brooklyn, about 800,000 votes or something. Um, this is going to play a role in down ballot access as well as, you know, the presidential access. Well, that's why I think it's really important for Congress to revisit the Voting Rights Act. I mean, the, the, it, it's true that the tests in the Voting Rights Act were dated and the Congress had not been able to update um, the formulas. And this is that was a weakness in the Voting Rights Act that was exploited in that decision. Um, but uh, that would be a really long process uh, to, for Congress to revisit the Voting Rights Act, um, to reinstate more modern formulas, and then to see through some um, sub, sub suits. But it seems to me that that's the only th that has to be done. So I see that Sayo has a question, and. Let's see, you should be able to, un to unmute. Well, for us, Perrin, uh, so you talked about the Help America Vote Act and how part of that was, uh, the purpose of that was to um, help uh, ensure that more people have access to voting. So I was just wondering if you, like what your thoughts are on the election process moving uh, towards a more digitalized version uh, going forward, uh, especially because it could lead to more people having, uh, being able to vote but it could, and at the same time, it could also lead to it being less reliable. So I was wondering how, like what you thought about that. Um, 
Sayo, I am not a, an election attorney, and we will talk to election attorneys in a month, you know, uh, one day of dialogue. But um, what I have read, you know, from the Brennan Center and from other attorneys and law professors um, suggests to me that electronic voting, you know, it's, our t it's a technology of today, and then it could be fine as long as we take the precautions that we should to upkeep, you know, the equipment and uh, to preserve the voter, you know, the voting rolls themselves, um, to perform routine tests, make sure that voters have a written backup that they can see. I mean, you know, some forms of voting feature a voter um, um, casting a vote and not being able to see that vote kind of go through. We're, we don't have that kind of experience in New York because we actually see it on paper and then it, you know it's scanned into a machine. Um, so my response is, you know, I don't see anybody saying that we should go back to lever machines or, pay, or, or hand cast paper ballots. But, I, but we probably can work with the technology that we have with more of an investment in the, uh, in the state infrastructure um, <clears throat> to make it safer, to make it more reliable. I can't believe I just, I, I Dr. Parati, have just endorsed something digital, um, but I did. <laughs> Professor Prady, you have embraced all of this technology as we've gone online, so don't, <laughs> don't undersell yourself. Um, we have a question in the chat area. Um, how would you help the voter base care about down ballot and local elections? That's a really good question. Um, so, you know, how do you make young people think about down, vote, down ballot and local elections? Um, I had a student in class last week say, why is there not better um, civics education in high schools? I didn't really take much civics in high schools. Well, you know, there's so much else to learn. There, there are a lot of ways to attack it. One being um, be better civics in high schools. Um, but also, um, it, it's difficult because young people, as you know, young people um, don't they don't, they engage in other kinds of activism, but they don't necessarily vote. They know a lot about particular issues that they're engaged on. Um, so I think that um, it's incumbent upon the older people in their lives to kind of include them in um, and to talk about public affairs with them and to be excited about training them to go into public affairs um, I think all of us are really, really excited about training people to go to work for work in government. That's kind of what makes me wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, I don't think there's a magic bullet. I think that um, the adults in uh, young people's lives have to um, transmit the, the idea that it, this is important. They have to care. We have to care. Um, I have another question from a student. Uh, Melanie Quackenbush is on the line. I'm going to unmute you. I think that should work. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, so first of all, thank you so much to all of you professors and doctors. This was really educational and uh, very interesting. My question was about you, well, you talked about the different safeguards that there are for elections and different dirty tricks that the various groups use to try and kind of influence elections in their favors. What do you have to say about like gerrymandering and how that influences elections? And do you have any ideas about the safeguards against those influences? Yeah, I mean, the, the um, gerrymandering is one of those things that's legal but it's not um, ethical, right? Um, it, it, it's not nice, it breaks up communities and it's aimed at disenfranchising some people and giving other people more of a say so in the electoral process. Um, I mean, generally the curative for that has, that's been suggested has been um, nonpartisan commissions. And um, that's something that I think is really important. Um, the partisanship, it has to be taken out of gerrymandering, even as it it, it seemingly can't be taken out of gerrymandering. 
Um, so there are a number of, um, not only there are, and there are a number of groups, um, fairvote.org, um, reform groups, kind of cause that advocate for these kinds of um, reforms. But I think what we need is wholesale reform and we need it at the national level we need it at the national level rather than just at the state level. Uh, you know, I think we, the thing that I wanted to make clear in this talk, um, which really looks at basic principles, is that this is about something that's happening at the state level and that's been happening at the state level for many years to create inequality. When that happens, the national government has to step in and protect rights and, and, and protect the Constitution. But unfortunately, in this case, the Constitution, as we said at the outset, does not have that amendment that Richard Hayson wants us to have. Um, so I think, again, I, I think the national government really has to step in and enact a series of reforms. Thank you. So I, I think that will be our last question for this evening. I wanna thank all of you for attending. We had a wonderful turnout. And I particularly wanna thank Professor Parati for sharing your knowledge and for exciting us to go out there and register to vote. So thank you so much, Professor Parati. Thank you very much for allowing me to be a part of this. This was really exciting. It was fun preparing for it and thinking about it. Um, and it gave me something productive to do while I'm worrying about people not coming out to vote. <laughs> uh, and if you are not registered, or if you know somebody that's not registered, needs an absentee value, ballot, um, is not sure whether they're registered, please, please contact me. We have these hours for voter registration between three and four on Wednesdays. But if you contact me by mail, uh, by email, I can route you to um, our team and we can help you um, uh, through vote.org. Are there any other voter registration and information uh, venues that I need to mention here? Again, I say that looking at my friend, Barbara Epstein. Um, should we mention any other organizations? Hold on one second, wait, I'm, I'm unmuting you now. You have to click a button, I believe, to unmute. Whoops, I just did, oh, hold on one second. Okay, you should be good now, Barbara. Okay, the um, Nassau County Board of Elections website nasavotes.com is excellent. What it allows you to do, if you're any place in New York State and you want an absentee ballot, the application is right on, the, on that site. You click on absentee ballot and it, it allows you to tell what county you're in, in New York State. And it's a, it's a two page, I think it's very easy site to get an absentee, uh, absentee ballot. So I recommend, highly recommend NassauVotes.com. Um, I also put in the very beginning of the chat, the New York State Board of Elections website. And from that website, you can click on any county in New York State, in, including Nassau. What happens is the Nassau one takes you directly to the state link. So you don't even have to go into the state website. You go to the Nassau website and it'll take you to the state link. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. I have a fun one for everybody. For any state you're in, Stephen Colbert has up a web page. He does like a fun comedy routine for every single state. And you can know, it's called, I think it's called Know Your Ballot. So, you know, Google it. It's Stephen Colbert. I believe it's Know Your Ballot. He's doing all 50 states and it's pretty funny. So it's about voter restrictions. No, it's just about how to register and all the rules of each state, how to get your ballot, when you, the date you have to have it turned in. He's doing it for all 50. He started with the states that have already sent out ballots or the earliest to send out ballots. So those are up and they're fun. They're really fun videos. Check it out. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, all. Thank you, everybody. Yep. Be well.